When reading the instructions for the building of the tabernacle, it's important to pay attention to the language that is used. One interesting feature here is the distinction between the language of tabernacle or dwelling place and the language of tent of meeting. When we go through the creation pattern in the description of the building of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting language is especially used for days 4 to 6 in that pattern, but tabernacle is used for days 1 to 3. That distinction suggests two different ways of considering the tabernacle. The tabernacle is primarily the dwelling place of the Lord, but secondarily it is the meeting place where Israel met with the Lord. Tent of meeting is typical language in the book of Leviticus, where the focus is upon interaction between God and his people. But elsewhere it is the language of tabernacle and God's dwelling that is most prominent. When we read the descriptions of the tabernacle, there is also a danger that we can focus far too narrowly upon static objects, upon inert pieces of furniture. But furniture in a home is an invitation to corresponding forms of life. Chairs are an invitation to seating and to conversation and fellowship. A bed is an invitation to sleep. A table is an invitation to a shared meal and to conviviality. The furniture of the tabernacle should be considered in a similar way. The Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat correspond to God's enthroned presence in the midst of his people. The Table of the Presence corresponds to Israel's honoured place at the king's table. It corresponds to the communion that God extends to his people. The lampstand corresponds to glorious light and the illumination that God gives in the darkness. The altar of incense corresponds to the prayer of the people ascending to God's throne. The bronze altar corresponds to the offering of ourselves and our works to the Lord through symbolic substitutes so that we can enter into his presence. The bronze laver corresponds to God's cleansing of us. The furniture of the tabernacle then is a stage set for a lively play in which sinful human beings enter into the presence of the holy God and are blessed there by him. The ark is the footstool of the Lord's throne. It doesn't guarantee or contain his presence. Israel needed to beware of trusting the ark or the tabernacle as if they were some sort of talisman. The Lord's acceptance of the tabernacle as a site of his dwelling is not something to be taken for granted. The tabernacle was always in danger of functioning as a sort of an architectural idol, as a device for controlling and summoning God. Perhaps the greatest challenge to such an attitude can be found in Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 1 to 14. Solomon communicates the fact that the Lord cannot be contained by a building made with human hands. Even the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain him. The Lord's dwelling in the house, or in the tabernacle, is true in a particular fashion. It's a dwelling that is real, but needs to be understood in terms of the Lord's transcendence. The Lord is really present in, but he's not enclosed by the temple or the tabernacle. The Lord dwells in thick darkness. His dwelling is mysterious and impenetrable, and the tabernacle retains something of this character. The tabernacle is a site of the Lord's dwelling in his personal and purposive presence. He acts from and identifies himself with the tabernacle as location in a unique way. The tabernacle is a sort of face to which people can turn to address the Lord. Just as your face doesn't contain your personal presence, but manifests and communicates it, and is the realm in which others address you, so the tabernacle is a sort of face of the Lord to which all of Israel can turn. In his prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon focuses upon the temple's relationship to prayer. It is where the Lord manifests his personal presence, and it is here that people should turn to address him, to the place where he reveals himself. Jesus, of course, is the great temple of God, and many of the ways that Solomon speaks of the temple, and we can think about the tabernacle, can inform our understanding of Christ. He is the one in whom God is personally known and addressed. As Solomon's prayer makes clear, the temple is principally a house of prayer. It's not a sort of occult technology for controlling God through sacrifice. It's not an idol for manipulating God. No, it's a divinely established building where the name of the Lord dwells, which orients and facilitates people's personal address to him and their comportment to his worship. The sacrifices serve a similar purpose. They are a sort of symbolically enacted mode of prayer. 
in Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 to 7, in a passage that our Lord later takes up in the Gospels, the temple is powerfully described in a way that the tabernacle could also be described as a house of prayer 